Welcome to the Living Faith Missionary Church Podcast. You're about to listen to a message from Pastor Chris Starn, Senior Pastor at Living Faith in Yoder, Indiana. It is our prayer that this message is an encouragement and a blessing to your life. Got your Bibles? Go ahead and turn to the book of Isaiah. I gotta get mine up. There we go. We are going to be in the third chapter of Isaiah. You know, the year was 1919, and uh, there was a, a poet, his name was William Butler Yeats, and I, I would argue he was probably one of the greatest poets of the 20th century. And he wrote this poem called The Second Coming. In this poem, he gives us, he gives us a, an interesting a look into what he thought was going on in his world at the time. And it's also what's interesting about it is that it is timeless because it shows you what is going on in our world right now. It's amazing how he had insight into our modern world. And I'm just going to read the uh, first verse of this insightful poem. Here's what it says. It says, things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere our anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The world at the time uh, when he wrote this had just had been had been experiencing the war to end all wars, World War One, supposedly to end all wars. But the reality is, is that war ushered in probably the bloodiest century in history. So far, at least. And I'm afraid that that century, that the 20th century, has led us to this century. And I think this century will be known probably as a century of social degradation. At least so far. What's interesting is if we, if we look at Isaiah, if we look at what was going on in Jerusalem and in Judah at this time, there's a lot of correlations between where they were and where we are. The society was degrading. And, and Isaiah is going to look at this. But in the midst of looking at what's going on, what God is allowing to happen, we see God. And we do that today. God's going to work terrible things for Judah. He's going to, awful, horrendous things are going to happen. And there's going to be a lot of fear. There's got to be a lot of pain. But God is going to be in the midst of it, and he will take that, and he will make it into something beautiful. God's doing the same thing, I think, in our world today. We go through a lot of pain. We go through a lot of trials um, socially, you can't deny that we are degrading as a society socially. Um, and we could, I could talk for probably days about the, the different causes of this happening. But it is happening. And I truly believe that in the midst of this, God is going to bring about something good and beautiful in the end. Because see, God... Even in our own lives at times, what he will do, he will lead us into loss in order to give us gain. Now, obviously, in the midst of that loss, we don't see that, and it's difficult. But we have, what is amazing is we have Isaiah. We have a a look into what it was like in Jerusalem and Judah and what God was doing. And and God, believe me, God loves us as much as he did them. And he's probably, he's going to do the same thing for us. I truly believe that in the end, everything is going to be awesome. We just have to walk through a lot of trouble to get to it. And believe me, when I say that, I'm not saying that God's going to make our lives here perfect. What I am saying is when Christ comes back, it will be perfect. And that's what we look forward to. So God is, in Isaiah, he's going to speak rather bluntly about uh, the mess that Judah had gotten themselves into. And and remember, the the reason why Judah was there was because they forgot God. 
The reason why I believe we are where we are is because we have forgotten God. As a society, as a world, we have forgotten God. But sometimes, even though God's speaking very bluntly and truthfully, sometimes, you know, we need to hear that. I, I need to know, I need to hear the truth about what I'm going through. I need to hear the truth about what is happening to me and what's happening around me. I need to know the honest, ugly truth. Don't like it. Don't want to hear it, but I need it. But the great thing is, is that while God is being blunt, what he does, he does it in the midst of the context of grace. It's not that God is, it's not that God is going to completely wipe out Jerusalem and Judah and going to forget about them. It's not like in our society today, in our world today, that God's just going to let us spin until, you know, like a, a centrifuge is we're spinning around and ultimately, you know, if you're on a, if you're on a merry-go-round and it goes too fast, what happens? You start flying off and people get hurt. And that's not what he's going to allow to happen. Or oh, for some he will, those that don't believe in him, but for his children, he's not just going to, he's going to allow them to go through, but he's not going to forget them. God is going to save his people and in the process of saving Judah and Jerusalem, he's going to bless the whole world. But we first have to deal with the loss. And what Judah is first going to experience, and what I think we're seeing and experiencing in our world today, is a loss of stability. Let's look at what it says in Isaiah 3, verses 1 through 7. It says, Behold, the Lord God of hosts is taking away from Jerusalem and from Judah support and supply, all the support of bread and all the support of water. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of places I want to go with that, but let me just say this with just that verse there. People ask questions like, why does God, why did God make this bad thing happen? Well, understand, sometimes God does get physically involved and he does make things happen. Sometimes he allows things to happen because of the choices that we make. Sometimes he allows things to happen because of the choices history has made. He allows things to happen because of the choice that Adam and Eve made in the garden. There's a, I'm reading a book called The Coddling of the American Mind, and they're talking about this, this uh, almost a religion of safetyism that we've implanted into our children today, where we're afraid for our kids to get hurt, and it's making them have trouble as they get older. You know, I, I remember as my kids were little, I'd let them venture off a little bit in the yard. I'd let them run across the, run across the concrete, but I'd be right there in case they fell down. Or I'd let them wander just a little bit away, but I still wanted to make sure I could see them. And that's the way God is with us. He's going to allow us some freedom. And we have a choice to make. Either we use the freedom correctly to worship him, or we wander way too far. But the amazing thing about it is, as his children, he follows us. He knows. He sees us. But he's going to take away all of their bread, all the support of their water. The mighty men and the soldiers, he's taken those away. He's taken away the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder. He's going to take away the captain of 50 and the man of rank, the counselor, the skillful magician, and the expert in charms. It's a good thing he's taken those away, because those are the things they weren't supposed to be doing. And I will make boys their princes. And infants shall rule over them. And the people will oppress one another, every one of his fellow and every one his neighbor. And youth will be insolent to the elder and the despised to the honorable. For a man will take hold of his brother in, in his house of his father, saying, You have a cloak, you shall be our leader. What a great way to choose a leader. You've got a jacket, you be the leader. And this heap of ruins shall be under your rule. In that day he will speak out saying, I will not be a healer. In my, in my house there is neither bread nor cloak. You shall not make me your leader, me the leader of the people. See, what, what Isaiah is seeing, what God is revealing to Isaiah is that God is going to take away foundational things. He's going to take away some things from the people that they actually need, their support, their supply. Everything that they, they had that made them comfortable, everything that they had that made them solid and secure in who they were and where they were. 
That sounds very familiar today. This idea of support and supply. Now, both of these words are translated from one Hebrew word. One is feminine, one is masculine. I know it's kind of hard for us to understand because our language is not normally that, you know, one word can't be both. But the Hebrew word is both. And the reason why that word is used is because if it's both, then it encompasses everything. God is taking, it's like pulling the sheet out from underneath somebody. He is completely removing everything that brings them stability. There's going to be a total and ultimate meltdown in Judah. So much so that the young are going to oppress the elders. There's not going to be anybody who can lead. They're going to be led by children. You're going to say, hey, why don't you be the leader? And that person will say, I want nothing to do with it. Because what am I leading over? He says, this bunch of ruins. It'd be like buying a house and then going there to, to move in. And it's, a, it's all falling down. And it's like, move in. It's your house. No, I don't want that. I want nothing to do with it. So societies will begin to dissolve into chaos in Jerusalem and Judah. This is a warning for us today. Because sometimes what God does is God will deny us something, deprive us of worthy leaders. I mean, it's hard enough to find a worthy leader. But when you have them, sometimes God will take them away and not allow them to, be, to lead you. And, and now you're lost. And I'm not talking about Donald Trump because I'm not so sure he was a worthy leader. I have no, I'm not even going to go there. But I, if, if, if you don't have people who are good leaders, they're not leading the people to worship God. So now you're just going to get the worthless ones. The ones who lead you away. So God's going to pull everything out. God's going to take their leaders and replace them with irresponsible boys. And again, society dissolves into chaos. Understand that if, if God is removing leaders, then, then good leaders are a gift from God. But also understand, just because we, we might have a good leader in the, in, the, in the White House, or maybe we have a bad leader in the White House, we still need to be praying for them. It doesn't eliminate our responsibility. Just because we have a leader who's a schmuck, doesn't mean we don't have to pray for them. In fact, we should be praying for them ever the harder. But understand, God is the one who gives us good leaders. It says in the scripture that God is the one who places kings in place. Always. Nothing happens outside of his purview. Paul tells us in Ephesians where the church gets its leaders. In Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, he says, He and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. God gives leaders to the church. And their purpose is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. This is, this is one of the things when I watch other pastors, especially ones that are outside of this area that are mega church and so forth, I look at this. Are they teaching the people to actually work the ministry? Or are they trying to make the people feel good about themselves? Are they talking about Jesus? Are they talking about repentance? Are they talking about forgiveness of sins? But the point is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And tell, why, when do we stop? We stop and we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. To mature manhood. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The leaders of this church must continue to do their work until everyone has matured. To the knowledge of the Son of God and to the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. This is why we have weak churches today, is because we have, not, we have not built up people to know Jesus and to live for Christ. And now all these other doctrines can easily come in, and we're blown back and forth like, it's like a reed that gets blown by the wind. Or by human cunning. 
by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, this is the truth, that we, the hard truth we need to hear, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with, it, with, with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That is the purpose. That is, what the, that is actually what the Jews were supposed to be doing. The Judahites, the people in Judah and Jerusalem were supposed to be doing. The leaders were supposed to be building them up. They were supposed to lead them to God. And in the process, Israel was to lead the whole world to God. And they failed. Because they were weak and they didn't stay focused on God. They didn't walk in the light like we talked about last week. Good spiritual leaders are to lead people to God. But unfortunately, sometimes that's not what the people want. Let's go to verse 8 of Isaiah 3. And what Isaiah is going to do is he's going to explain why this has happened. Why is God doing all these things? He says, For Jerusalem has stumbled, and Judah has fallen because of their speech, and their deeds are against the Lord defying his glorious presence. For the look on their faces bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them. For they have brought evil on themselves. Tell the righteous that it shall be well with them. For they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked. For it shall be ill with them. For what his hands have dealt out shall be done to him. You're going to get what you, what you gave. See, the people had, 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 of Judah had, had actually denied and had forgotten the true relevance of God in their lives. They were children. They were, God's, they were God's chosen people. They didn't have to worry. They thought they didn't have to worry about that. They needed God in their daily lives like we do today. Oh, they, they wanted to be forgiven. They wanted to be protected. But beyond that, they just wanted to keep God on the sidelines. Keep him, keep him out of our daily lives. And what they would do is, they would, what a lot of us do today, is they would compartmentalize God. Yeah, I'm a Christian, but I don't let that, let that bleed over into my daily life. I don't let that bleed over into my workplace. I mean, I can't. I mean, I'll be, I'll, people will look at me funny. So I'll go to church on Sunday, but that's all I'm going to do. That's my, I'm, I'm, I'm saved. I'm good. We're good. You can't. You can't compartmentalize God. You can't keep him out of your lives. That's not what he wants. That's not being a Christian. That's not being a believer in God. And what ultimately is going to happen, this is going to lead to their downfall. And I believe that's what's going to be the downfall of our church, churches today. That they will compartmentalize God. They won't bring him into their daily lives. They won't teach about sin, repentance, salvation, Oh, they talk about purpose, God's purpose for your life. We talked about that. God's purpose for your life is to love him with everything you have and to love the na your neighbor as yourself and to go and make disciples. That's God's purpose for you. That's what should drive your life. You know, and just like what Judah is going to do, we, we, we try to blame the world around us, right? We try to, we try, well, it's the world's fault. There's too, much, there's too much temptation in the world. When the reality is, is that many times we bring evil onto ourselves. We're just like Judah. We're no longer ashamed of our sins. This idea, this idea of shame is difficult for people today. I don't want to be shamed because I get embarrassed when I'm shamed. I don't like that. I don't like the way it makes me feel. So don't shame me. As it says, as Isaiah is saying here, it wasn't just that they were sinning, but they, were, they weren't hiding their sins anymore. We hide sins all the time. They were doing them all out in the open. And they would boast about it. Paul shows us in the book of Romans what happens when we push God to the sidelines. It says in Romans 1, 8, uh, verse 20, verse 28, it says, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, which means they didn't bring him into their lives, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. 
They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. It pains me just to read those words. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. One of the, uh, I'm probably going to go over today, but that's okay. One of the, I just want to tell you this, some things that I've been experiencing this week, some things I've been reading and watching. There's a new movement in, in the churches today that this whole idea that heresy is in every church. That, you know, we can't just, we can't call out every kind of heresy. We just can't do it. We shouldn't do it. Because we need people. We need, we need to have sinners in the church so we can share the gospel with them. And there's some truth to that. Yes, we do need believers in the church, we, uh, uh, sinners in the church. We need to be sharing the gospel with people and helping them see God, have interact with God, have a relationship with him so that they can be saved and they can be redeemed and they can spend eternity with him. But the problem is, is that many, many churches today don't see any problem with having heresy in the leadership. There's a church, I'm not going to name it, pastor has divorced his wife six months ago. They, they filed for divorce. Just recently, uh, it, was, it was a month ago, he was caught with a married woman from the church in a compromising position. And he has now restored himself to the pulpit in four weeks. There's no accountability. There's no accountability. There's heresy in that church. And people have left because of it. Leadership has left because of it. You can't have heresy in the leadership. It needs to be called out. Now, it needs to be done with love and compassion, but it needs to be called out. But see, even in our actions against God, that doesn't stop God from working. See, we have a choice. We can either delight in God. We can either, either glorify him and, and ask him to come in and to glorify, have his glorious presence in our daily lives. And we can honor him or we can defy him. There's no middle ground. Everything hinges on that choice. See, the leaders of Judah, they are going to have to answer to God. Just like all leaders today, of all churches, are going to have to answer to God for their leadership. Did they do what Paul says back in Ephesians? Did they lead people to God? They've oppressed, and they've led the people astray in Judah. And this breaks God's heart. In verse 12 of Isaiah 3, he says, My people, infants are their oppressors. The women rule over them. Oh, my people, your guides must lead you, and they have swallowed up the course of your paths. The Lord has taken his place to contend. He stands and judges people. People tell me, don't judge me. I said, oh, me judging you is the least of your concerns. There's somebody far greater than me that's going to judge you. You, need, you better make sure you're right with him. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders and the princes of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people? By grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord of hosts. See, instead of being good leaders and leading the people as good shepherds, what do they do? They take the choice things from the people. They enrich themselves. Today, I, I would argue that this is some of the word of faith pastors who are, you know, <laughs> these people are coming to them and they, they do their, their spiel, and, but then they, you know, they got their five mansions and their three airplanes and, and they're confronted by it and they just blow it off. That's no big deal. 
Shouldn't God be blessing me? Shouldn't I be rich? No, you shouldn't. Should you be taken care of? Yes. But do you need a golden bathtub? No. Not when there are people, the poor and the widows, who need help. See, what happens is false leaders will ride on the back of others. And God loves his people. And these false leaders and all the leaders in society and of churches are going to have to answer for what they've done. You know, it's, it's easy when we sin to think that God doesn't see it. You know? As little kids, what do we do when we do something wrong? We look around to see if mom and dad are watching, right? If we're really good, we, wa- we look and see if mom and dad are watching before we can do the thing that's wrong. God never sleeps. His eyes are forever on you. That's why I think our eyes need to be forever focused on him. and What he wants. See, Jesus, Jesus himself set the example of what a good leader is. Because he was a good leader. In John 10, he says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I, I have come so that you may have life and have it abundantly. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. You know, I think the body of Christ and all of us as true believers in Jesus Christ Long for revival. We want to see the church rise up and, and, and be strong and be true and praise God. But understand that revival is more than just passionate preaching, more than just enthusiastic worship and meaningful prayer. Because see, what revival actually does is it awakens our knowledge and our realization that we have a responsibility to each other. Which is completely antithetical to our, to our selfishness. And it's this idea of the sacrifice of self. So if you want to know, if you want to know, is the Holy Spirit in me, is he really working in me? Then you've got to examine, am I being sacrificial? Truly sacrificial. Not so that I get glory. Not that I can say, hey, look and see what I've done. But are you sacrificing yourself? Are you sacrificing things for others? Because that's what the Holy Spirit do. Because that's what Jesus says. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A leader needs to be sacrificial. And so we need to do, we need to sacrifice ourselves for others. When John the Baptist announced that the, God's kingdom was coming, the people say, well, what do we do? The kingdom's, God's kingdom's coming. What do we do? And this is what he tells them. He says, and he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with them who has none. And whoever has food is to do Likewise. He didn't tell them, oh, well, you need to get down and pray. Oh, you need to do this. He says, no, you need to take what you have and you need to give it to others. I found that interesting. He says, the kingdom of God is coming. What do we do? You actually need to be sacrificial. If people need food, give it to them. That shows that you have the Holy Spirit. See, as believers in Christ, we need to make sure when we're interacting here in the church and when we're interacting out in the world that we are life enrichers, not life depleters. I think too much today, you know, we have a tendency to be life depleters. I, I'll, I'm looking at me when I say that. Catch me on a really bad day when I'm frustrated and I'm tired and I'll suck the life right out of you. God bless my wife. She has, who said amen? No. (laughs) Dave's just sitting there smiling. But you're right. God bless our wives and our spouses when we are in trouble and our parents when we are just, and our friends, when we suck life out of people unintentionally most of the time. But we need to be life enrichers. So God is going to take away the stability 
And I think that's what he's doing to us today. There's also, the next thing he's going to take away, he's going to take the loss, he's going to take finery away from them. Because another way that God judges us is actually by replacing our arrogance with something that we dread. Something that we just absolutely don't want to even think about. Look at verse 16 of Isaiah 3. It says, The Lord said, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes. And I'll be honest with you, this, he's, using, he's saying the men first, now he's doing the women. I believe that you know, there are men who do this too. So don't, don't think we're being sexist here. We're, not, we're just as guilty as, as any woman would be of doing this. Mincing along as they go, twinkling with their feet. Oh, I know, sorry, I twinkle with my feet, but twinkling with their feet. Therefore the Lord will strike with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will lay bare their secret parts. In that day, the Lord will take away the finery of the anklets, the headbands and the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets, the scarves, the headdresses, the amulets, the signet rings, the nose rings, the festal robes, the mantles, the cloaks, the handbags, the mirrors, the linen garments, the turbans, and the veils. Instead of perfume, there will be rottenness. And instead of a belt, a rope. And instead of well-set hair, baldness. Jeff's not in here, is he? Okay. Um... And instead of a rich robe, a skirt of sackcloth, and branding instead of beauty. Your men shall fall by the sword, and your mighty men in battle. And her gates shall lament and mourn empty. She shall sit on the ground. And seven women will take hold of one man on that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called your name. Take away our reproach. What I think is, what God is showing to Isaiah here is, is he's showing them that they're going to be captured. The Babylonians are going to come in and they're going to take them. This is, a lot of this is what happens when an invading army comes in and takes over and takes you into captivity. But there's also, you think about there's a lot of spiritual things here. This idea that he's taken away all of the finery, all the things that we adorn ourselves with, all the things that make us feel good about ourselves. And he's laying bare who we truly are. And this all happens because of haughtiness. You think much greater of yourself than you should. And what this is in reality is evil pride. Understand the, the danger and the, the awfulness of pride. When, when Satan fell, when Satan sinned against God his first time, it was pride that made him do that. It was his evil pride that caused him to turn against God. And to be full of pride is to be in complete anti-God state of mind. And this is what Judah has done. And, and it is what I'm afraid, I'm afraid what our society is doing. We're pushing God away. We are anti-God now. Or, worse, even worse, is we water down the gospel so much to make it acceptable to our society and to our culture that it's worthless. It's worthless doesn't mean anything. makes you feel good. So, it's not about your feelings. It's about God. So God's going to exchange our pretense of reality for something that is unspeakable. Now, we all, both men and women, and we always fall short of the glory of God. We men, we swagger. Women display false beauty. That's not what God created us for. See, the, the secret to a beautiful woman is when she radiates the glory of Christ. The secret of a handsome, awesome man is when he radiates from his very core the gloriness, gloriousness of Jesus Christ. And 
This is what Peter tells us in 1 Peter says, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. You know, we should always tell our children, you know, when you, when you first start dating, I've had to have this conversation with my kids, they don't, and we'll have it again as they get older because they're only, you know, 12 and 10, but we want to get them ready for this. You know, you'll see somebody and you'll be attracted to them and you'll think, oh, aren't they good looking? Don't trust that. Get to know them. Get to know their family. Get to know their history. Get to know who they really are before you commit to spending, to attempting to spend your life with them. Especially before you attempt to pretend like you've already started spending your life with them. Jude is going to suffer loss upon loss upon loss upon loss. And it is God who's doing it. He's going to take away the very things that bring them stability, the very things that they beautify their lives with. And he will do the same to us if we don't bring him into our lives. But see, what loss, losses we must suffer so that we can prize Christ as our only gain. We, we suffer loss because those are the things that take the place of Christ. And we need to have him in our lives. We have to look at our, the terrible cost of our pride and lay it aside and look to Christ and look to God because ultimately that's what he's going to do. It's going to be Jesus all the way. He's going to come back. So we have the loss of stability. We have the loss of the finery. But, you know, there's, there's great, amazing things. There's great gain in loss. And gain in the loss of finery. But it's, because in the end, there's a great gain in perfection. And this is what Isaiah says God's going to do. He says, in that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. And the fruit of the land shall be the pride of the honor of the survivors of Israel. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who has been recorded... For life in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by the spirit of judgment and by spirit of burning. Remember the promise that God made to Noah? I'll never again destroy the world by water. No, the next time it's going to be fire. He, never said, he didn't say he wasn't going to destroy the world. He says it's, the next time it's going to be fire. It says, then the Lord will create over the whole side of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day and a smoke and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a canopy. There will be, there will be a booth for shade by day from the, from the heat and for a refuge and a shelter from the storm and the rain. God is going to create something new. Much better than what he took away. See, the, the hard thing is, is that we, those things we have, those things we hold on to, we, we cherish them because we love them. We are so used to them. They're part of our lives. We want them so bad. What we don't understand is if we hang on to those, we can't get the thing that's even better that God is offering us. But unfortunately, not everyone's going to enjoy this new thing that God will be doing. This is only for those who have been redeemed. Those who who know Christ, those who know the branch of the Lord, which is Jesus Christ. See, there's not going to be any more rival agendas going on. We won't have a Congress that argues two different sides. We won't have people who argue. And if they do have a dispute, as we learned earlier in Isaiah, God, they're going to bring them to Jesus, and he's going to judge for them, and he's going to judge justly. No more pet causes, no more swollen egos crowding the church of Jesus Christ. It's all going to be washed away forever. But I must, must tell you, that we, we need to make sure we remember that we, we are looking forward to that day when that happens, but we don't do it and place our hope in avoiding judgment. And the reality is, you know, we should find our hope in going through judgment. We should find our hope in walking through trials in this life. 
It's, I know it's hard. I know I've been through them. I'm going through them now. But you know what? If I keep my eyes on Christ and I find the good things that are happening and I find joy in him and I find that he does have me, I, I, he's got me, I'm okay. That's worth living for. That's worth putting my hope in. I put my hope in Christ, not in this world, not in people of this world, not even in this church. This is not where my hope is. My hope is in Christ and Christ alone because of what he's going to do when he comes back. Until then, I'll, I'll walk through whatever God wants me to walk through. I, I, I mean, believe me, it's not that I'm not going to cry and not that I'm gonna be, not going to be in pain. Oh, I'm going to cry. I'm, I cry a lot. I've been crying a lot recently. You know? But I know that my hope lies in Christ. See, it's only when we walk through judgment and we come out clean that we can enjoy the presence of the Lord. That's that flaming fire by night that he talks about here. And the cloud of day is truly who God is. And that reflects, obviously that reflects back to when the Israelites were being led out of Egypt. By day there was a cloud that led them and by night there was a flame. And who was that? That was God leading them. God's presence is going to be with us. We're going to see it. For now, he's with us still. Jesus says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'm with you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've asked God to forgive you for your sins and you've repented of them, which means you don't do them anymore, you're saved. And he's with you always. See, time is progressing towards this moment where his glorious presence will cover the whole church. We will feel sheltered by his presence. We, we should feel that today if he's, if he's truly part of our daily lives. We should feel the sheltering of God while chaos is going on all around us. We can feel safe and sheltered. But in the end, we'll have it physically. It'll be present. It'll be perfect. The key, the key for us to understand is, what do we need to give up that we cannot hang on to because it's going to burn up in the end anyways in order to gain what we never can lose? Let's pray. Thank you for joining us today. We hope this message was a blessing to you. If you're watching on YouTube, please like this video as it will help in spreading this message into the global online community. Please consider subscribing to our page so that you will receive notices when we post new messages. If you're watching this on Rumble, please hit the Rumble button for this video so that the gospel can be spread into the Rumble community. Also, consider subscribing to our Rumble channel. You can also listen to our podcast on Amazon Music and Apple Podcasts. We hope you have a blessed day.